Hi, welcome everyone. We're here for another uh, seminar of our seminar series, Perspectives in Artificial Intelligence, a series that uh, invites uh, leading researchers from, uh, from international institutions. Today, we're happy to have Fabio Ramos, uh, who works at the University of Sydney as a professor and also in, at NVIDIA as a principal researcher. Uh, this is a series of seminars sponsored by the Center for Artificial Intelligence, which we call C4AI. It's a center sponsored by IBM and FAPESPI, a center committed to state-of-art research and artificial intelligence. We, we produce research, we, tr we try to uh, distribute results uh, widely in society. Um, today, as I said, we have Fabio Ramos. Fabio Ramos is a professor in robotics and machine learning at the School of Computer Science, University of Sydney, and also a principal research scientist at NVIDIA. Uh, he actually studied at uh, Universidad de São Paulo. He was here uh, an alumni. Uh, is an alumni. Uh, he received the engineering and master degrees at USP, uh, and he got his PhD degree at the University of Sydney in Australia. Um, Fabio has done research in uh, mainly on statistical machine learning for large-scale Bayesian inference decision making, with lots of applications: application in robotics, mining, environmental issues, healthcare. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed publications in top conferences, top journals. He's got several best paper awards, student best paper awards at several conferences, um, including IROS, International Conference of Intelligent Robotics and Systems, the Australasian Conference on Robotics and Automation, the European Conference of Machine Learning, the Robotics Science and Systems Conference, uh, top conferences all over the world. Uh, we're happy to have Fabio here to talk about uh, leveraging re differentiable simulation for reinforcement learning and Bayesian domain randomization. Okay, so we're very happy to have you, Fabio. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you so much for the uh, invitation. Great pleasure to be here, connect with the friends in Brazil, and uh, get to know more about the center there. So let me... Um, Share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can uh, see my screen. Yes. All right, so um, today we're gonna uh, be talking about simulation right simulation and how simulation can uh, really change the way we do machine learning uh, particularly for robotics right so the title you see there right leveraging differentiable simulation it's uh, quite a long one uh, uh, and and technical but this is really uh, how uh, and what I'm going to be uh, talking to you about right so it's a, a summary is how can we train robots in simulation to perform well in the real world? Let me start uh, by first giving you an overview of some of the things I did in the past and maybe tell you uh, a little story. So this is uh, 2008. Uh, I was finishing my PhD uh, in Australia, right? And, you know, it's a big country. And most of the cities are uh, by the coast, but there is one area on the west, northwest, uh, that is actually quite an interesting area uh, because there's a lot of minerals in there. Uh, it's really hot. You know, temperatures can go up to uh, 46 Celsius, 50 Celsius sometimes. And this big mining company uh, came to us and said, uh, look, guys, uh, you know, I would like you to come over and uh, automate the machines uh, uh, we have here. And I said, okay, um, sounds like cool. Might be one of the most interesting projects because well, the machines are big and I like to play with big toys, right? So we went there and started studying the problem, studying the process, the process of mining. And mining, uh, as you know, some of you in Brazil might have seen uh, some of these things, but this is iron ore mining, right? I mean, removing iron ore uh, from the mine. And that involves a process where you first uh, drill these holes uh, in the ground. You fill it up with explosives. Each hole uh, uh, can, can be loaded with 200 kilograms of explosives. 
and then you you, you blast these uh, uh, holes, right? You have about 200 of them in one of these uh, benches, as we call, and that fragments the rock, uh, the rocks which uh, can then be uh, uh, removed through an excavation process, put it in a uh, on a truck, uh, and, and then uh, process uh, to extract the iron, right? So what you see here is the first machine we uh, got to play with. So this is a drill. Uh, we made the drill autonomous, and the drill was not only drilling, but what was very interesting at the beginning of the project is that, well, uh, when you uh, uh, drill, when you are drilling, that's actually the very first time you get in contact with rocks. That's how you have physical contact with rocks, and as you drill, you can sense, you can get information from, uh, uh, from these rocks which will be very useful to then try to infer uh, the minerals. I can uh, talk, you know, hours and hours about this project, but uh, uh, fast forward um, and, and how we actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, managed to, to accomplish all of this was by first the defining and designing a simulator. So what you see here is the simulation process for that drilling, right? As the drill drills through the ground, uh, you start collecting information, mechanical vibrations, and, and uh, 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 as the drill pushes through the material, you see here the different geological layers. And we could, through the simulation, do a lot of things that would be much harder to do in the real life, not only because we had to be there in the mine uh, uh, for, for a long time, uh, uh, which is always difficult, uh, but because in simulation we can play with different parameters of this, uh, of this process. So that was good. So simulation was important for us. And uh, let's try now to look into the trucks, right? And, and this is one of the trucks we were uh, uh, automating. All right. So what you see here is a sandwich, a car sandwich. Uh, which was the result of putting some, you know, machine learning method inside this truck, particularly not well-tuned, without so much uncertainty estimation. And uh, uh, let's see what happens when we do this from big machines. And, and as you can see, the results were not that great. So that led me to, uh, uh, you know, really change the way I, I see researching robotics, um, because it's not just about making stuff move around but you need to make things move around safely and robustly. Moving forward, uh, this is, you know, 10 years after that project started. Uh, and we now have about 100 of those trucks uh, moving around in, in, in this region in, in, in Australia. Uh, the mine is very much uh, automated, not just the drills you saw that, but these trucks, right? They, they can now uh, move around the, the different areas of, uh, of the mine. Uh, we define what is called an island of uh, uh, automation where the trucks can, can move uh, and we try to isolate people outside that area for uh, uh, essentially for uh, guarantees that no one uh, will be hurt. This thing has been operating 24 hours a day for quite some time. What you're seeing there are people that provide maintenance, people that uh, monitor the process and, and so on. But beyond the, uh, the automation of these uh, uh, vehicles, uh, it's actually the entire information flow that happens through the uh, mining process. So what you see here is uh, essentially kind of almost in real time, so this people uh, in Perth. So Perth is, is a major city in, in the west uh, of Australia, uh, where they can see different parts of the, uh, the, the, the process, the SCADA systems and so on, collecting all the data uh, uh, for us, integrating into a model, and then uh, 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 watching uh, the different parts of the process and continuously um, improving the entire uh, mining process. All right. So what are the lessons I learned, uh, you know, over years and years of uh, uh, looking at automation uh, of these machines? So one of them is, well, automating 200 tons. So these trucks are about 200 tons. It's super fun. 
And I can always tell my, my friends in the robotics community that, you know, my, my robot is bigger than theirs, which is fun. Uh, simulation can speed up research and development uh, significantly. And it's much more safer. Uh, it's much safer to fail in simulation than in real life. Modeling uncertainty and adding redundancy uh, uh, are critical for operating in, in large autonomous systems. And uh, finally, uh, companies, in most cases, uh, are interested in automation solutions, not just automating a truck, right? And, and that's something, uh, as robotics, we need to take into account, right? We are not just automating a single robot, a single piece of equipment, but actually trying to automate the entire, the entire process. Okay, with this in mind, uh, this is the outline for, uh, for today's talks, right? So uh, we first gonna dive in into some of the uh, uh, work that I've uh, been doing here uh, uh, at, uh, at NVIDIA. I will then show you how uh, this is connected to one of my favorite topics. My, it has been my topic since, since I was doing my master's, right? With Fabio Calvin back in Brazil. I'm still doing probabilistic inference. And then we're going to reach out to uh, other areas uh, in policy learning and reinforcement learning. Let's start with uh, robotics uh, simulation. So let me give you a brief history of where simulation is uh, in robotics today, right? So if you go back to any uh, uh, in, in 2002, you might have, uh, for those in robotics, right, you might have seen this thing called Gazebo. It was probably the the, the most popular simulator out there is still, uh, is still uh, uh, present in the robotics community. People still use Gazebo. What you see here is kind of simple. You can simulate perhaps one robot. Uh, the sensors are there, uh, are quite uh, simple, actually. Uh, back in 2008, uh, um, it was the development of this thing called Mujoko, right, which was acquired by uh, DeepMind uh, a couple of years ago. It actually added lots of contact models and, and um, some improvements on the modeling of the dynamical systems that actually made Mujoko very popular, right? Uh, it was also free uh, of charge at some stage, uh, became uh, commercial at some stage, and now it's free again. But Mujoko is, is a, a pretty nice simulator, right, that a lot of people used back in 2009. Then companies started making robotic simulations. So VRAP is, is one of these uh, uh, simulators by uh, Coppelia Robotics that in 2010. Then Ari Cummins uh, create PyBullet, uh, which is still very popular today. It's an open source simulator. Uh, uh, can do uh, a lot for you, uh, but still has some uh, limitations, which I, I'm gonna uh, talk to you about. And then more recently, uh, NVIDIA started to develop simulators that uh, you know they, they could do the physics on a GPU and, and therefore you could scale to many more uh, robots, right? We're just seeing there this uh, uh, lag robots uh, in a project we did with uh, ETH in Zurich where we could actually uh, deploy thousands of those robots being simulated at, at the same time. More recently, uh, there's a new simulator called Isaac Scene, which adds real-time, real trace uh, uh, rendering to a lot of the simulation uh, in Isaac Gym, uh, right? And, uh, and you see the, uh, 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 as we carry on here, how uh, impressive these simulations can be today. And by the way, all of this is available uh, free of charge, right? Any, anyone can can look at this. But going beyond simulation, uh, what I've seen happening uh, much more recently now is the emergence of languages, languages that allow one to develop, create your own simulator, right? So Tai Chi is one, uh, 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 which was created uh, at MIT, and, and Warp is a project we have here. Uh, it's essentially a language, just like PyTorch, but compiles uh, kernels that can uh, be used to develop your own simulator, and it's fully differentiable. We're going to talk about differentiability in a minute. All right, but just to give you an idea of where I think things are going, uh, where I think the, the, world, the world is evolving in terms of simulation, what you see here is uh, Isaac Sim, right? So uh, a simulator that NVIDIA has been developing uh, for robotics, and how we are uh, looking to automation of very big uh, uh, industries, right? So what you see here is actually a BMW uh, factory uh, in, in Germany where we can simulate 
the uh, not only the the uh, you know the movement of parts from one uh, area to another, but we can randomize over different aspects of this process. You know the sizes, the the stockpile, the warehouse, and everything else. Put that back into the simulator, improve and and tell uh, BMW how to improve the uh, the process. Okay, so simulators are are good, but if you go to the you know anyone in the robotics community. They will come back to you and say, okay, I like your simulator. I like your idea of simulation. But what if simulation is different to the real world, right? And, and then uh, 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 if you have a simulator, how can I actually use that to do better decision-making inside this, this simulation? And the decision-making needs to actually uh, uh, be performed in, in the real world. So then uh, 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 brings me to to actually the topic I wanna uh, discuss today, which is how do we address these issues in, in simulation and connect that to modern machine learning, right? So all simulators are wrong, but some are useful. So let's see what simulation actually does. And let, let me define a few, a few terms here for you, uh, which I will use uh, throughout this talk. So imagine I have uh, different simulators here and simulators have parameters, right? So they have physics, parameters. So let's say I don't know friction, or I don't know the masses of some of these uh, uh, objects I'm manipulating, or if I'm doing fluids, I don't know viscosity or some of these other uh, parameters, right? Uh, these are things we would like to infer from, uh, from data, right, by observing the real world. But when we first run the simulation, we need to put values for these parameters in there. So you put some of these values right there, and once you put these values there and you say, okay, simulator, now do this simulation. For us, we call this forward modeling, right? It's essentially the process of forward modeling. I go through the differential equations inside the simulation, solve those equations, and we're going to have a, a, you know, a, a simulated behavior or simulated trajectories, okay? That's what we expect it will happen if these equations are solved correctly, uh, uh, assuming all our uh, hypotheses are, are correct. Well, uh, the other thing we have is, uh, well, then we, we look at the real world. And the real world might actually differ from what happens in simulator. And, and uh, what we'd like to do then is, well, given the real world, how do I actually change the values of these simulation parameters, you know, friction, viscosity, and so on, and adjust them such that the simulator can better replicate the real, uh, uh, the reality. Okay, and this process is called inverse modeling. That distribution we see there with two peaks, well, we call it multimodal, uh, uh, tries to describe the, uh, uh, the possibility of multiple solutions for the problem, right? So uh, as with uh, many physics problems, the inverse problem is uh, sometimes ill posed. So there are many possible solutions uh, to address this. And a lot of my uh, recent research has been around, well, can we design probabilistic inference models that actually allow us to use the simulators inside the probabilistic model to compute distributions over simulation parameters and then do something with this, right? How to adapt the simulation to reflect the, uh, the real world. All right, so with that, let me go to probabilistic inference. Uh, and uh, because I study uh, uh, in Brazil with Fabio Cosman, uh, and we kind of, uh, uh, you know, from the very beginning, try to think about the world as, as through this, you know, the lenses of this equation you're seeing there, right? Uh, where, you know, the data is not everything, our knowledge is not everything, and everything is a combination of these two things, right? This, these two facts, data and hypothesis. So let me uh, briefly address some of the terms in here, which I'm gonna use uh, next. So suppose you have some parameters you are trying to estimate. These are theta, okay? We call it a prior, we can put distributions over it. There's something else called likelihood fun function. And if you plug D, D is for data, right? They will tell you how much your data agree with your equations, with your parameters, with your models in there. This is your likelihood function. Determining the uh, uh, denominator is called the marginal likelihood. It's perhaps the most challenging thing for us because it requires integration over all of these uh, parameters and that can be quite complicated. And, and But if you can do it, you can evaluate what's called a posterior, right? What's the distribution of these parameters uh, given the data? 
That's what we want to try to do for our simulators uh, uh, here. And, uh, uh, but there is a catch, right? Uh, the problem is simulators are highly complicated, right? They, they, they have differential equations, solvers, and a lot of this that makes the definition of that term likelihood, uh, uh, likelihood term, likelihood function, very complicated. So one strategy uh, we've uh, adopted in this, uh, in this work called a basin is, is a way to go around that equation and still trying to build posterior uh, approximations over simulation parameters. Okay? So this is how we do it. We uh, suppose we have a prior over some quantity. So it could be you know, viscosity or friction or something like this. We sample from that prior. We plug the simulation in there and we run the simulation. That will give us one data point, what the simulation believes the world will look like. And we repeat this process. Now, now that, we, uh, that we have the simulation, you know, trajectories over time, uh, and we have the prior, we can do this uh, little trick uh, because we can build a regressor from the outputs of the simulation, these trajectories, back to the parameters, right? We model that conditional distribution directly. And that is an approximation to the posterior, right? So essentially what we are doing is this, right? Is a process where uh, you see the priors and uh, uh, the prior P of theta down in the slides. We fix for any uh, uh, adjustment we have to do in there. It's a kind of important sampling type of uh, fixing. And we learn this function called Q, which is a conditional distribution directly addressing uh, uh, the posterior over the simulation parameters, right? Where X is actually the real data we observe in there. I'll give you more examples to make this uh, uh, more concrete. But what, because this technique does not require the definition of that likelihood term, this is called likelihood free inference model. And uh, uh, there are proofs that show that actually, if we do this process and we, we, learn, we learn this Q and, and do the uh, uh, particular uh, adjustments, to that, this converges to, to the right posterior. And Q could now be any uh, model, so let's say a neural network, that outputs probability. So at the top of the neural net, you can have, for example, a mixture of Gaussians, as you see here, or it could be something uh, else called normalizing flows or any kind of fancy uh, uh, parameterized distribution that comes uh, uh, out of that, where this uh, phi here, uh, uh, essentially features extracted from the data you collected from, from the simulation. Okay, um, now here's the other trick we want to do, and I will describe that later, right? Uh, in many cases, you also want to learn a policy. And what is a policy? A policy is essentially a function that maps states, so where the robot is in the world, to actions, what the robot should do to maximize a specific uh, uh, quantity. In this case, it is the cumulative reward. So, you know, in reinforcement learning, every time the robot performs a, 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 an action that we seem correct, we give it a, a little a reward uh, on it. And what is interesting is uh, there is this idea called domain randomization. If we don't know how the world actually looks like, but we have a distribution on how the world looks like, we can do domain randomization. And the idea is to take one extra expectation on how we uh, uh, compute this, the, these rewards uh, uh, and randomize over these different environments. So the policies learn not on a single environment, but many of these environments all sample from that posterior, right? So that's the idea uh, uh, of basing and how it connects to policy learning. We're going to go to some examples, okay, in a minute. But that's, that's what domain randomization is. We randomize over our environments and we train our, our robots in, uh, in, in these uh, environments. Okay, uh, um, first uh, uh, example. This is actually a tricky uh, problem. Uh, we were interested in inferring uh, material properties uh, of these uh, uh, beings. Right? I think what we have here is, is uh, uh, kind of couscous, right? Uh, that's a work uh, in collaboration with uh, UC Berkeley. Send a, a student to us to work on this here over summer, summer in the US. Um, and, and we were working on uh, uh, basing to uh, try to infer uh, the properties of this. So what you see in the middle is obviously the robot dropping material, uh, dropping this into that uh, cup. And by watching the uh, maneuver of this material, we can then try to directly infer 
uh, uh, the properties of this material. So this is what, uh, what happened, right? We are interested in estimating physical qu quantities like uh, rolling friction and restitution parameters between uh, uh, all these little grains in there. And, uh, and what we can do is to pour the grains, uh, the, the particulates, through this funnel. And depending on the height of the funnel with respect to the ground, you have, we will have different patterns. Uh, because, you know, the, 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 the grains will, will scatter through this, uh, this area. And what is interesting is we can use these pictures of how the grains look like in simulation and in reality and, and use that to try to infer these parameters, to come up with a distribution over that, as you saw that in, in basin. Okay? So we have a simulator for grains, which is actually quite complicated. We have the real world there, so with the robot pouring materials through this funnel. We can take pictures of this material. And then we see, uh, 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 we do the same in simulation, and then you see how to regress from this picture to a distribution over restitution uh, and rolling friction. And, uh, and it's actually quite interesting because we do get decent distributions out of this for these parameters. And once we have these uh, uh, distributions, we can train a, a very simple policy where we ask the robot to pour material uh, in, in different ways so we have a desired pattern uh, on the ground. So what you see here is the robot pouring the material where the funnel is placed at different heights. And at the end, the pattern, which you see these three uh, kind of circles, are essentially the pattern we would like it to achieve. And it was all trained in simulation after we adjust for these parameters. Okay? So that is uh, one application uh, of a problem that is uh, quite complicated, actually, in terms of the uh, physics simulation, where we can directly adjust, adjust the parameters of that and turn that into a little uh, policy for it. Um, here's another problem, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and Caroline Matteo was the, the, the student who worked with us in this process. Uh, that was during COVID, right? Uh, and uh, she managed to bring this UR5, the big robot, to her living room in Berkeley. And she didn't have any cameras, so uh, instead we put three microphones. And these microphones were capturing the sound of balls bouncing uh, on a surface. You might be hearing the, uh, uh, the ball uh, bouncing. And through the, uh, uh, the difference in, in time in which the sound uh, hits the different microphones, we could estimate the position of these balls. And from the position of these balls, we run that through the simulation, compute the distribution parameters over the uh, properties of the ball bouncing process. You see the real ball and the simulation. And a tennis ball. And a moon ball in there. And once you know the properties of how a ball, a ball bounces through that uh, surface, you can then train a robot to drop the ball at the right height and um, uh, to have the, the, the ball in a cup, for example. And obviously, the ball dropping process is chaotic, right? So we actually don't expect that the ball will, will uh, fall into, into, into the little cup every single time, but it should reflect uh, uh, the percentage where reality is, right? And you see here for the other, uh, uh, the, the other process, the, the moon ball, which is actually much more complicated. Uh, let me move forward a little bit because we could also do this. This, again, this is just based on sound, right? There are microphones in there and we are tracking the ball just by listening uh, 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 the pings, the bounces of the ball into this, uh, the, 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 this, uh, this surface. And the robot automatically moves uh, uh, to get the ball in there. Okay, so all of this uh, that I show you are essentially built on this technique we call uh, uh, basing, right? It's a way to take any simulation, any simulator in there, and then inferring 
the parameters of the simulator at least uh, have a probability distribution over the parameters of the simulator given reality. You can apply this to different parts of engineering, right? So it could be from you know flying machines to robots to some of these examples. But there is one problem, right? This area and, and, and this process called likelihood-free inference, right? As it's known in statistics, and, and some of you might have heard of something called uh, ABC, uh, uh, which, which is the approximate Bayesian computation. This is, you know, perhaps the, the, the more uh, popular algorithm to solve this problem in statistics. We know that we cannot scale to many more parameters, right? So if your simulator has hundreds of parameters, we cannot help you, right? We can help you if it has five to 10 parameters, let's say through uh, Bayesian. But what if we need more parameters and we have the possibility of actually designing simulators in this process? So how do we to scale to more parameters? And that's where we're gonna talk about now briefly about uh, uh, you know, differentiable uh, simulation. So what is differentiable simulation? Uh, uh, so differentiable simulation is essentially a simulator and a simulator you can think of it as a, you know, as, as a function that is mapping uh, uh, states over time uh, and is differentiable with respect to its own parameters, right? In that case, restitution, for example, friction and so on. But if we have a simulator that is differentiable, means that we can specify what is called a likelihood, fun a likelihood function. Okay, so imagine that tau here is, you know, trajectories. The position of these balls we observe over, uh, uh, over time, and they are sampled from G, and I'm using G as a generative model, a, a, a simulator, for example, which is a function of its parameters. Um, I can uh, uh, look at the simulator. I can observe these this trajectories, right? These trajectories from, 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 from simulation. And I can build a data set of trajectories in simulation and in the real world. And if I have a set of trajectories, the dynamical system behavior in simulation and the real world, I can, and I know that the simulator is differentiable. So we are opening the, uh, you know, the box of the simulator. I can design a likelihood function or a loss, let's say, which, which could be anything, any kind of uh, notion of dif distance between real and reality. And this, for example, uh, could be, let's say, just the probability distribution over this loss, right, given the parameters of that simulator. Now, this makes us, uh, uh, makes probabilistic inference significantly more scalable, right? And we can now tackle many more parameters. And, uh, and we are not in the likely free inference world anymore. We can actually look at much, much more broader literature on probabilistic inference. And what you see in this graph is, you know, how I, uh, I characterize probabilistic inference these days, right? The methods that are really fast, but has kind of hand-coded maths and lots of assumptions. So variational inference in, in, is one of those, where you make significant uh, assumptions about the type of the posterior you, you, you hope to observe, right? So you think, for example, things are Gaussian, you know, approximate things with Gaussian. On the other side of things, you have, you know, the sampling-based methods, right? So like MCMC and, and, and versions of MCMC, which are uh, highly automated, but they can be quite slow, actually, if you try to uh, to run from, uh, uh, in, in particularly uh, high dimensional spaces, right? And our goal is to design something that actually has, you know, advantages of both worlds, right? It's fast and highly automated, so I can apply to different things. Now, uh, um, this is a project we did here. Uh, Eric Hayden was a, a student at uh, uh, USC, University of Southern California. Again, he spent a, a summer here uh, with us and we designed uh, a new simulation, uh, uh, a new uh, finite element uh, method for the formable objects uh, to simulate cutting, uh, robotics cutting, which is essentially you know, a, a system that simulates crack propagation and it's part of the damage mechanics, right? For the mechanical engineers there, you, you will recognize this. And the idea is, well, uh, uh, we have a material, in this case, what you see is, is a, a potato, and we are cutting that potato, and we're going to try to simulate that process in a differentiable manner. 
All right, but here's the challenge, right? We are cutting and, and you know, we couldn't possibly pick a worse type of uh, problem than cutting, right? Because when you cut, you make things, you break things, right? So when you break things, you, you naturally see that it's really difficult, uh, uh, you know, to get derivatives because you are breaking. There is this continuities in there. So our strategy here was uh, to actually design, a, a, you know, this is just a simplified version of what's in there, but it's a, it's a simplified simulator built out of, a, a, you know, a losing springs type of model, right? So you see this uh, spring damping system where the springs get weaker and weaker as we cut until the, there is uh, uh, no forces whatsoever. And the finite element method is built out of this, uh, these equations. And we wrote these equations and uh, using language, right, uh, uh, that allowed this to be uh, automatically uh, differentiable. So once you do this, we can plug that into our uh, uh, rendering. And what you see here is uh, simulating uh, our cutting of, uh, of an apple. And uh, as we go through the, uh, the process, and I hope you can uh, watch this, uh, this animation, you see the, the springs. The springs are, are being uh, cut. They are connecting the two meshes, one side and the other side of the, uh, uh, of the uh, potato. And we can, as we cut, as we observe the real world of the real potato, adjust for many parameters uh, in contact mechanics right? necessary to infer the process in, in contact mechanics, right? Some of these things are, you know, stiffness, softness, uh, uh, cutting spring softness, and, and so on. And as we do this process, right, what you see here is, uh, um, is the convergence of the force of the knife in simulation, right, which is this... Uh, purple kind of curve and how quickly it gets to the uh, to the ground truth uh, force profile as we optimize the parameters of the simulation right so very quickly our simulator learns how to simulate this complicated contact mechanics um, and that's the uh, what you saw in there was the 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 uh, kind of the likelihood f function, right? The, the likelihood uh, model. But since it's differentiable, we can look at the literature and pick some really interesting tools that allow us to actually do Bayesian inference in there. And what you are, uh, what I'm showing you here, without going to the equations, is something called stochastic gradient Landing dynamics inference. It's, it's part of the our MCMC set of tools where we use the differentiability of our uh, likelihood function, our prior, to collect samples, as you normally do uh, uh, in, in, in probabilistic inference. So what you see on the right is, the, uh, is an approximation for the posterior. And, and what you see here on the left, and I'll play this again in a moment, uh, uh, is the particle bouncing around and riding the chain where you know in Langevin dynamics you add some noise at each step of the process to collect these particles and it converges to the true posterior uh, uh, of the process, right? It's actually a pretty interesting uh, process and easy to implement algorithm, uh, and it's particularly appealing if you have differentiable uh, uh, simulation. And with that, we build these posteriors that look anything but Gaussian, right? They look pretty ugly over several uh, uh, physical uh, uh, parameters of that simulation. And then finally, once you have all of this in simulation, we can train policies in our speed and optimize for the cutting. Don't ask me how we managed to get, you know, a universal approval to put a knife uh, on the robot and perform these uh, experience, uh, experiments in there. But we are able to, you know, cut all these vegetables in simulation. And what was interesting, as we are cutting the vegetables, we could also infer the mechanical properties of the, the vegetables, right? So we can tell if the, uh, you know, the cucumber there is, is ready, uh, 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 you know, to be, uh, to be eaten uh, and other things, right? So robotics cutting through differentiable simulation. Okay. So... Can we scale even more? Can we actually go to the next step and, and actually have hundreds and hundreds of parameters in there? And there is one way we could do this. It's through parallel differentiable simulation. I'm now not doing one simulation at a time, but I wanted to do hundreds, perhaps thousands of uh, 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 simulation uh, in parallel. So these are some of the simulators that are, uh, uh, that are capable of doing this and how we are now training uh, robots, right? Through 
uh, 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 through this uh, the, this uh, simulators here. Uh, we run that in parallel, uh, and we can very quickly uh, optimize policies and, and so on. Uh, warp, uh, the link up there, is uh, is one of the languages we use to actually create simulations and and, and, uh, and build uh, uh, equations in a differentiable manner that we can use for, for this process. But now, if we have parallel simulation and particularly parallel differentiable simulation, we can do something even more interesting in terms of probabilistic inference than uh, 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 HMC or stochastic Langevin dynamics is this thing called Stein variational gradient descent, and and let me explain that to you uh, in in you know very few moments. You know I have hours of lectures on on how Stein variational gradient uh, descent works from a theoretical perspective, but the intuition is actually more important. So again, it's a non-parametric estimator, so things are you know, distributions are estimated from a set of uh, particles or, or, or samples, as you've seen there. So they can capture non-Gaussianity. Um, uh, it exploits the differentiability of posterior uh, uh, to scale to higher dimensions. And as opposed to MCMC, where you actually get one particle at a time, with Stein variational gradient descent, you have a predefined set of particles. So let's say I want to represent my posterior with 100 particles. And I update them in parallel as I observe each one of those. So for example, in this animation here, the particles are moving around to represent a posterior that looks like this, uh, uh, you know, kind of banana shape over math, uh, mass and length. These are two properties of uh, you know, a dynamical system we are interested in study. And, and you see here how the particles are moving around as the, uh, uh, as the gradient proceeds. And I compute the, the particles, the gradients of these particles in an online manner to build this uh, a nice posterior approximation, right? So everything comes in parallel. So as opposed to MCMC, I can now do probabilistic inference with a parallel hardware, right, which is actually very good for GPUs and other things. The way this works, I don't want to get into too much of, uh, you know, into, into the math of this, uh, um, but, you know, in, in, in statistics, there was this, this quantity or the, this, this field, right, uh, um, where you look at uh, a Stein uh, discrepancy to essentially to prove theorems, right? It wasn't actually uh, uh, something that you would design an algorithm out of, uh, out of it. But in 2016, uh, 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 the two guys that uh, were at uh, UT Austin came up with a, a you know a practical algorithm that looks like this, right? So if we have this uh, uh, you know a differentiable log of p, where p is the you know uh, uh, your posterior, you can take the, this uh, derivative and uh, uh, do uh, differentiate over each of these particles in parallel, and that gets weighted by this k. K is essentially a kernel, right? Because essentially what this the, uh, this is doing is reducing this time discrepancy in a Hilbert space, right? So it's a, uh, uh, in, in a functional space, in a sense. And uh, this equation, which you're seeing there, is not something I, you know, I came up with. It's actually that comes through the theory when you derive from this time discrepancy. It has two terms. One term that uh, uh, moves the gradient towards the area they're interested in. So in this case, it moves the particles to these three peaks. And you have a second term called the repulsive force that stops them from collapsing and try to capture details of these uh, distributions. So it's actually a pretty uh, interesting and effective algorithm if you want to do parallel uh, probabilistic inference uh, in there. All right, so uh, if we have that, uh, uh, then uh, this is again another project in collaboration with uh, USC. Uh, and uh, NVIDIA, we were interested in uh, inferring, you see the, there's this uh, robot there, it's got some masses uh, uh, inside this, uh, this cube, and you want to estimate the position of these masses in there. Uh, um, and uh, what you see here is another animation uh, of the, uh, the particles in Stein, because you know, another cool thing is uh, if we have procedures that we know, so for example, masses cannot be negative, we can actually put a constraint. So in this case, the particles need to stay inside the green box before they try to capture the posterior. And you see the dynamics of these particles, how they move around to start capturing this uh, uh, relatively complicated posterior in there. 
Anyway, this is a slide for those who are interested in probabilistic inference. Uh, come and, and chat with me if you are interested in, in, in probabilistic inference through this, through this time. For us in robotics, um, uh, allow us to you know, use our parallel differentiable simulators and build posteriors much faster than, uh, than other things. Uh, what you see here is this uh, double pendulum, which is perhaps one of the most uh, uh, popular kind of chaotic dynamical systems we have out there, where we can build uh, posteriors, for example, over the, the length. So let's say I don't know the length of the two arms in this uh, pendulum. We can come up with posteriors, right? We can learn posteriors of that just by observing the dynamical system over time. And you see the comparison of the posteriors from uh, uh, SVGD, so this is Stein and, and, and different uh, other models. Uh, other methods. And here is the experiment we did uh, with the robot in the lab where the robot shakes the, the box and, um, and we can infer the posterior over the position of these masses inside the box by, uh, uh, you see the, the picture in the middle uh, in there, right through a, a parallel differentiable simulator. Okay, so I, I hope I convinced you that parallel uh, probabilistic inference is, is quite important and connects well with uh, differentiable simulation. But let me now, uh, in the next, uh, let's say, five minutes or so, uh, take you to uh, the third part of my uh, um, uh, my talk here, uh, which is policy learning, right? So if we have nice simulators, right, that somehow reflect reality, can we actually learn policies effectively, policies of complicated dynamical systems? And uh, one tool we're going to use for this is, is this idea of reinforcement learning, right? So what's reinforcement learning? Reinforcement learning is a tool uh, where it, um, uh, we define a, a, a stochastic process, evolves through, uh, through time. Uh, we, can, uh, we have access to some kind of a policy that tells the agent uh, how to perform a particular uh, action, which action to take given where you are in, in a state. Um, and if you follow that policy, if you keep on taking these actions, you are uh, maximizing some kind of long-term objective, right? Uh, uh, that's reinforcement learning. What is very interesting is that, uh, you know, we were describing some of this thing to an NVIDIA CEO and he said, oh, great, you can automate me because I want to maximize this and that. So maybe one day you can automate my job. And I said, yeah, we are not quite there yet, but, you know, maybe one day. But one problem of reinforcement learning is actually uh, uh, is that it's very, uh, uh, you know, data hungry, right? So if you are to train robots, it will take a long time because we need physical robots to interact with the world for a long time. But maybe in simulation, we can do that effectively. Okay, so we're going to use parallel differentiable simulation on this. And, uh, uh, and we have, uh, we build this uh, GPU-based differentiable dynamic simulation. You see this, uh, the ants, after they learn how, how, how to walk uh, to specific uh, directions in there. This is the paper I was referring to, uh, where Jay Shu, he was a student at MIT who did um, uh, an internship with us here uh, as well, where we developed this. Uh, there is a nice uh, video in this uh, two minute uh, video in, in, uh, at YouTube where they explain uh, part of this paper and, and then show uh, the rest of the videos in there. But just to give you an idea how this work, right? Um, suppose this, this is the dynamical process, right? So we have states. So the, you know, the robot is moving from S0 to SH. So that's the end of my trajectory. And at uh, every time step, I take an action, right? A. And I want to take uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I want to differentiate this respect to the parameters of the policy, right? And a policy is a function mapping states to action. And it could be quite complicated, right? A policy could be a neural network with thousands, uh, uh, if not uh, millions of parameters. If you look at uh, uh, the landscape of this problem, right? So if theta is one of these parameters and we look at how uh, a change in theta affects the, the objective uh, uh, function, right? Or, or the loss, you see that the, you know, it's actually a pretty ugly landscape, has lots of peaks, uh, uh, this almost kind of discontinuities. It's super hard to optimize, right? If you want to find uh, the minimum uh, over a curve that looks like this. 
But through uh, uh, and uh, what is even more important, because these things go up and down so quickly, you have problems like gradient uh, explosion, vanishing, and, and things like that, that those who are familiar with reinforcement learning would know uh, a lot about. So what we did in, in this particular work is uh, uh, kind of do some kind of a, a average or approximation of gradients, right? So it's, it's, a, gradient, uh, it's a gradient estimator. Uh, and that's obtained by looking through these trajectories, breaking then the entire trajectory into a smaller chunk, computing some averages and defining some uh, value functions. Is this V uh, function you're seeing there? The details are in the paper, but what I want you to remember from, from this paper is uh, for, from, from the talk is that, well, even if I have a long dynamical system and I need to differentiate over all time steps, uh, which leads to gradient uh, problems, I can break that uh, 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 entire procedure into smaller chunks, do some kind of average, and have an unbiased gradient estimator built out of this. Thanks to our uh, uh, gradient uh, approximator. And, and what happens to the landscape when you do this, you go from an ugly uh, objective uh, function that looks like this as a function of the parameters to something that's much, much smoother and much easier to optimize, which is on the right. Okay, so, uh, and you can uh, also average over different environments, right? So we can have, you know, ants uh, operating in areas of different frictions, for example, different masses and so on, to make the system, the policies more robust. Okay, these are some of the problems where we test this approach, right? So you see things like, uh, you know, carpool, ants, humanoids, uh, uh, cheetahs, and, uh, and so on. Uh, these are kind of, you know, easy to hard uh, problems for us in, in RL, right? So the, you know, the swing up, it's very classical in, in control as well. When you go to the humanoid, what's well, a high dimensional uh, system uh, in terms of actions and state. So it's much harder to train. And this, this is hard. Um, but actually, this is the other one. And until we did this, it was impossible, right? This is uh, perhaps the, the most advanced model of the, uh, you know, the lower part of, of the body, right? So it's a, it's a model of the legs and all the tendons you're seeing there in red. It has 152 action uh, actions, right? Uh, uh, so if you want to learn a policy, that policy needs to output 152 actions at every point in time to make this thing walk. So it's uh, perhaps the, the closest we can get to the, uh, to the human level actuation uh, uh, for walking. So this is what is called a learning curve. So I'm plotting rewards as a function of the number of training steps. And the algorithm, uh, our method, right, uh, uh, it does a, a decent job on the easy uh, 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 problems like a, a car pole swing up, uh, uh, but beats uh, the other ones uh, by quite a significant margin as your problem has high and high dimensions, right? Particularly this humanoid uh, MTU model is quite a complicated one and you see how much faster, so that's the right, uh, red line in there, how much faster we achieve very high rewards. But what does uh, high reward actually means? Uh, this is what it means, right? So we can uh, look at the dynamical system and see operating uh, from the policy. So you see the humanoids, and here you see our uh, walking dynamical system, right? The humanoid MTU model after we train the policy. So they actually have very convincing uh, behavior, particularly the walking uh, pattern uh, uh, you're seeing there. Uh, very similar to what a human would do. You see that he leans forward to, you know, uh, speed up and, and, and runs, kind of, and that uh, achieves higher rewards depending on the friction we do in there. Okay, so let me summarize uh, uh, what I uh, briefly described to you today. Uh, with powerful uh, simulators, uh, robots can learn to make decisions in simulation before being deployed to the real world. That's our goal. Probabilistic inference uh, is a tool for us to quantify uncertainty. Uh, in, in the simulation process and do a better scene to real uh, uh, translation. Differentiable simulation can scale simulation parameters and simulation uh, parameter inference to hundreds of variables, uh, as you saw in some of the examples here. Uh, 
And parallel differentiable simulation is an exciting new development, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, now available to, uh, uh, to us. Uh, uh, and I think there's lots to be done uh, uh, in this area of parallel simula uh, 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 simulation, parallel differentiable simulation for sync to real and policy learning. So with that, I would like to thank all the uh, co-workers, you know, all, all, all the, the folks, my collaborators that made this possible. And I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabio Ramos, for your presentation. Uh, it was very insightful, very interesting. And uh, it's a pleasure to me and to the Center for AI to receive you here. Since uh, before the pandemic, Fabio received uh, many of our students in his lab in Australia. And it's a pleasure to me to, to meet you now here in this presentation. Well, let's pass to the questions. The first question is a usual question we have been asking uh, all the participants. Uh, it's how uh, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has affected AI research, both in positive and negative ways? And uh, also in this context, how have you worked with this possibility of doing robot simulations instead of doing real world experiments? <laughs> uh, that's a great question, right? So uh, the the um, it was a challenge. Uh, I remember back in uh, 2020, 2021, where Caroline was working with us, uh, we actually had to ship this huge UR10 uh, robotic arm to her uh, uh, apartment uh, in Berkeley. So she was, you know, PhD student uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, uh, that arm was on top of her uh, uh, dinner table uh, and she had to also set up all the uh, sensors, you know, microphones, cameras, all, all these things. Uh, uh, so it was quite a challenge actually. Uh, but what is important in robotics is that, uh, you know, we, we need a robot somewhere in there to actually say that we are doing robotics and, and showing that things can work. What came out, out of the uh, COVID-19 challenges is that, well, maybe now with these simulators and, and making sure that we have a distribution of simulators, right, with different parameters, different cases, we can now go back to the robotics community and say, look, guys, um, if something actually works across all of these simulation processes, we have some notion of guarantees that could work in, in reality, right? And... Um, and I think that has helped the robotics community now to embrace simulators uh, uh, more and reduce the amount of experiments, right? So, uh, for example, uh, at that time, Google was trying to do reinforcement learning and they built a factory, uh, a farm, I should say, with 50 arms, each arm $100,000. And, and you ask, who in academia can buy all of these arms to do reinforcement learning and maintain all of these pieces of equipment, right, uh, uh, in a lab. Only Google could do that, right, uh, 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 and, and large companies. Not something the universities would do. And, and we look into that process and said, no, we want to actually democratize uh, robotics, right? And maybe through simulation is a good way of doing it. Perfect. Yes, uh, the simulation saved our lab during the pandemic because we, we turned to simulations in autonomous vehicles since it was not possible to, to perform a, a real world experiment with a lot of researchers because one experiment for safety reasons need a lot of people together to, to, to implement and to realize experiments. And the simulation was uh, fantastic in our case. And also learning from simulations now in autonomous vehicles, you know, uh, we use a lot of uh, simulations in order to create data sets and learn how to drive autonomously. So really, uh, I think simulation is very important and also uh, 
parallel tools like uh, tools provided by NVIDIA are fantastic because we can uh, perform many, many simulations and get uh, very interesting results to improve our research. So, yeah, thank you. And maybe also uh, we can uh, uh, work together in a distributed form and uh, our students, it's very good to send students to Australia or US, but uh, with simulations, we can share the lab, a virtual lab. And I think that it's a very interesting way uh, to collaborate with other researchers, or other groups to work with simulations that uh, uh, are shared between us. So uh, I, I think, uh, do you have students that uh, are working now in different countries and uh, sharing simulations and uh, tools? Yeah, in the last uh, two years, because of COVID, uh, all of our interns were actually remote interns. So we would ship them uh, equipment and they would set up stuff, uh, particularly computers, right? We would ship computers, you know, GPUs, give them access to the servers we have internally here. Uh, uh, and this will be a remote. So this year is going to be the first year where the interns will be back in the lab. Uh, and and uh, things here in the U.S., because we are in the Northern Hemisphere, right? So the, the students come for summer, uh, uh, meaning uh, June, July, uh, beginning of August. Uh, they come from all over the world, right? I had some students from Sydney uh, who join us here uh, in, in Seattle. They complain a bit because, you know, uh, summer here is actually worse than, than winter in Australia. Uh, but... You know, that's a little problem uh, with, uh, with, with the weather here. Um, that's, that, that's fine. They get used to it. They come here for work anyways, right? Um, uh, but internships, remote internships has been uh, actually uh, quite useful, right? We learn how to work with interns uh, remotely. And what is good is that even after they leave, we can continue to work with them. So now I have adopted students sitting in different universities and we engage with their supervisors in, in their own universities, right? So it's actually a great way to collaborate uh, with uh, all the universities and other labs. For sure, for sure. Perfect. So uh, we pass to the next question is from Fabio Cosman that uh, is asking, look at this uh, research you are developing uh, from NVIDIA what is the relation between research on probabilistic models and deep learning? What are the connections between these topics? Yeah, so um, I didn't quite mention, but pretty much every estimator, uh, almost every estimator I mentioned in this was what is now known as, as a, a, a deep neural network, right? So. The, the policies that uh, we just saw in, in, in the RL uh, case was, a, uh, was a, a deep network, right? There was uh, outputting, uh, uh, outputting actions. So it was a, a deep neural net. Uh, the in basin, this uh, regressor that was outputting a, a mixture of Gaussians or, or, or any other distribution was a deep net as well, uh, right? So I think the, the deep nets are throughout the, uh, the process, right? Uh, and, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't even talk about the, the latest transformer models and all this super large, you know, with billions, uh, uh, trillion of parameters here uh, uh, because they are arriving now uh, uh, in robotics. And, and I, I still don't have probabilistic inference methods that would work in trillions of parameters, right? Maybe one day we are not there yet. So our networks are deep have lots of parameters, but not as deep as GPT-4, for example, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 so we are getting there. Having said that, I don't think we actually need something uh, with billions of parameters for most cases in, in policy learning, right? I think we can narrow that down with a reasonable size neural net uh, or other things. Uh, uh, Another interesting direction now is, uh, and we are working on this now, is 
for some simulation processes, things are highly difficult to come up with equations, right? The dynamics are quite uh, complicated. Uh, uh, contact dynamics is, is one of them. And there is this uh, uh, field of graph neural nets, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, a very interesting connection where you learn potentials. Uh, you know, if you, if you remember Markov Reynolds fields and other things, you remember you have binary pairwise potential, unary potentials. Now these potentials are kind of neural nets and you run belief propagation through them. Uh, and then, then, then these things converge to something, right? So we are actively looking to the uh, statistical properties of uh, graph neural nets to actually add that component as part of the simulation process as well. Yeah, perfect. Yes, I, I, I talk a lot with uh, my students about reinforcement learning. And for a long time, I was really uh, very critical about reinforcement learning because you have uh, discrete, di discrete states and uh, actions, and the world is, does not work like that. You, you need to, to understand physics, dynamics, and uh, the majority of deep learning problems, uh, classical deep learning problems, uh, where uh, uh, they, they have several problems to, 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 to move from the simulations to the real world. And now we have uh, deep uh, reinforcement learning methods. Uh, so I imagine you are using in, in these models you, you listed uh, some of these uh, tools of deep uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, you can learn the model and the policy but in a, in a way you integrate simulation, you, you can really work as uh, you have problems of the real world. So uh, do you have some specific tool of uh, deep uh, reinforcement learning? Yeah, that you use? so uh, all, I, you know, in most of my examples, or actually all my examples is every, everything is continuous, right? So it's, the state is continuous, the actions are continuous, and we have 152 dimensional action spaces, right? Continuous action spaces. Now, uh, this is what is interesting. If you look at the deep RL uh, uh, literature, you find in the derivation of the methods, the on policy and off policy methods, right? That includes PPO, uh, uh, you know, uh, TPRO, and all of this, uh, a trick called the reinforce trick which is a pretty uh, uh, rough approximation to the gradient. Because you need to take gradients respect to the policy parameters, right? To optimize them, right? And the policy is a deep neural net. And you look at the approximation of these gradients through the reinforced trick, it's ugly. I mean, your gradients are all over the place, which makes deep reinforcement learning a really tricky optimization problem to solve. So, Part of the motivation for this work was I refuse to use reinforce because it's almost like a heuristic these days, right? If you run that for long enough, you might end up in a good policy, but you know, depends on where you initialize and so on. And what we have is through differentiable simulation, I can get much better uh, uh, gradients of the policy. And I don't need to do the reinforce trick, which is painful painful and computationally inefficient. So a lot of that, right? So cutting trajectories and using the gradient and averaging them give us an unbiased estimation of these gradients, which again, we can bound the gradient uh, 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 variability in there, uh, even without using covariates and some of these things that people do in stats uh, and actually have policies that train much faster, right? So we, do, we did have comparisons with, you know, conventional deep RL in there. But the tricky bit is you actually need to have a simulator that is differentiable. Uh, so we actually had to build our simulator from scratch. So that was the, the price we had to pay for that. Perfect. Uh, really uh, fantastic. I, I think uh, major people that uh, is uh, looking this presentation, this, this question is really important uh, to, to understand and to see other ways to, to do uh, artificial intelligence learning and uh, thank you very much for your answer but uh, well uh, 
we, we can also uh, discuss a little bit about uh, what you said uh, about uh, large models. La now we have GPT-4, large language models. And uh, for me, it's something that uh, also it's very important in artificial intelligence is that uh, I think uh, to understand the physical world, we live in a physical world, to understand the physical world, to, to have some kind of intentions. Uh, human usually plan the actions, uh, simulate in your brain the results of your actions and select uh, with a policy, with a, uh, the best uh, option. Uh, and this is part of our intelligence. So uh, when we talk about GPT-4, we, we have that just only with words. You select the words, just considering a huge number of parameters, and uh, you can uh, predict the next word, but not predict the physical behavior of some uh, uh, subject that is discussed in the, the text. Uh, so uh, the question is, do you think that we need for advanced AI that is going to general uh, artificial general intelligence that is not uh, uh, present today, but uh, do you think that uh, in order to achieve a, a better artificial intelligence, we need real, we really need uh, physical simulation, prediction, considering the, the physical loss, not only words <laughs> like we have in ChatGPT. So, what do you think this this relation that uh, are a lot of people talking about ChatGPT? And uh, do you consider ChatGPT uh, real intelligence? And uh, mm -hmm. do you consider that we can achieve a big intelligence using just uh, large models? Or uh, do you think this uh, research you, you are doing now about simulation, uh, prediction, and uh, policies and continuous values are really necessary to, to get a, a next level of artificial intelligence. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit philosophical here, right? And, and obviously my answer will be entirely biased on, on some of the motivation I show uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this talk, right? Um, you know, uh, not long ago, I, I would say that the answer would be no to any notion of uh, uh, generative, you know, uh, uh, generic intelligence coming from artificial uh, uh, system in the next 10 years. Uh, after I uh, had access to GPT-4 and, and BIRD, so BIRD is the, you know, is the Google tool. Uh, I got a bit scared, actually, uh, because it's not just a sequence to sequence uh, problem. Uh, that the transformers are coming up, but I can actually put a puzzle, uh, you know, describe a puzzle in there, and then uh, in many puzzles, uh, they were uh, able to solve that puzzle. So there's some notion of intelligence still very far from uh, what we would consider as a, a human uh, intelligence. It doesn't mean that it's not uh, useful, right? I think there's a lot coming out of it. Uh, uh, but as I said, I got scared because um, I don't know how these things actually work. I mean, I know how to implement the model. I know how to train it, but why it works the way it works, I don't know. And actually, I don't know anyone who knows. And, and uh, if you look at the beginning, right, my third slide, fourth slide there, I made the case that if I cannot be robust on something that has artificial intelligence in it, I can have really drastic, catastrophic uh, consequences. Uh, so in my view, it's not until we have a model like GPT-4, a large language model or other things that not just output one answer, but also how wrong it might be uh, about that answer, right? It's, it's that thing I learned, I think, very early in engineering that is best to be imprecisely right than precisely wrong, right? And if you give one answer, 
to a problem. Very uh, commonly, you're going to be wrong. And I like to be at least a little bit right. So I much prefer language models that will give us some notion of uncertainty, some notion of how accurate that, uh, so I can make systems that are robust to it. So imagine a lawyer that's trying to, you know, make, uh, make some decision or a judge based on some inference that was made through a, a sequence to sequence model like this. It doesn't know how wrong the system might be about it. There's no confidence level about it, right? So I think that is essential for, you know, robust decision making and, and uh, we need to be careful. And if I was to put efforts into this uh, field, uh, to develop this field, I would try to bring robustness and confidence and that kind of thing embedded from the design process of them. Okay, so what about explainable AI in these models that you have uh, when you learn about physics? And... Yeah. Dynamics. That was interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, I had a, a project in the in the past where we were uh, trying to measure some some processes in the brain, right? So by, by uh, you know looking at a, a MRI machines and 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 taking gradients with respect to the uh, neural network parameters and plotting that a, a, as as graphs and you know as pictures and, and get some intuition for what the uh, the parameters we're doing as we go down in, in, in a, you know, kind of standard uh, deep model. Uh, with transformers, right, which is essentially the, the, the architecture behind all these sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, models, it's kind of difficult to do that, right? Uh, um, you kind of, you can do little tests and test hypotheses and see if this hypothesis is correct or not, whether the model would follow or not. But having all of those you know, there are so many explanations for the things that you'll be super hard to do them all, right? And then trust your life to something uh, like this. Um, so I think uh, Explainable AI has, has a, a strong role uh, to play in that, but not, I think, necessarily to uh, look at the models that are already trained and try to explain what is happening there. But I think... In the designing phase, how can I bring explainable AI in the designing phase such that the new models become explainable? And you can then confirm or not hypotheses you have about the, the, uh, uh, these things being, uh, uh, you know, uh, the process uh, behind that, right? And, and people in other fields do that all the time, right? In economics, you have a model of how the economy works. Uh, that might be really far from reality, but you test, right? You do back tests and, and, and you, you you confirm or not that hypothesis. And, and then you say, okay, this hypothesis is correct with this level of confidence, right? So there are tools that, you know, scientific tools we could use that uh, to, to help. Uh, uh, but nothing better than design systems that have explainability at its core from the design process. Uh, the, the issue is I don't know how to do that uh, with Transformers yet, but that's an area I think we should all put our brains together to, to address. Perfect. Really great. So uh, I have a, a last question that is about uh, your work in NVIDIA. So what are the main tools available from NVIDIA to everyone to work with uh, optimization, physics, parallelization? Do you use some specific tool? Do you, do you know about tools that can help people that uh, are uh, looking this presentation that can use in the research? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think a, a, an interesting point uh, uh, is the model that NVIDIA tries to adopt uh, with uh, researchers, academic community, and, and even other companies, right? Uh, because a lot of the uh, uh, things I show you are, are open source or free of charge for sure. So, you know, the, all the simulators I show, uh, I show today are available. Anyone can download. Uh, the language is this thing called Warp. Uh, it's free, it's open source. People can download and use it as, as they want. Uh, and the way NVIDIA works is, you know, they design all of the tools that go very close to the GPU, right? All the CUDA, the CUDA kernels, 
the uh, the the uh, the FFT, right? So if you are interested in doing FFT for signal processing, there's QFFT. If you are trying to train uh, 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 recurrent neural nets, there's a CUDA package uh, uh, for it. There's for computer vision and so on. So many of these tools are already embedded in, in popular kind of Python libraries like, like PyTorch, TensorFlow, uh, and so on. But out of the tools, and, and NVIDIA has lots and lots of tools and many more than uh, what I know of, but in robotics, uh, lots of our controllers are now kind of embedded into this uh, uh, simulators, right? So the simulator, you download the simulator, it comes with a controller, right? That we work here and we publish as a research and, and so on. And some are GitHub kind of repos. So this base scene, uh, which I described today, uh, is also a, a, you know open source repo that people can uh, download and, and use it, right? So the model here is very open from, from that perspective. Perfect. So uh, thank you very, very much, Fabio Ramos, for your presentation. It was an honor and a pleasure to receive you here in uh, our virtual stage of Center for AI. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the audience that uh, was present uh, uh, following our uh, Perspectives on AI session. And also, I would like to thank Fabio Cosman uh, and uh, in the name of all people from the Center for AI, also the people are supporting your, our transmission as uh, Mauricio Klein that is in the backstage uh, making the things work. So thank you, Fabio Ramos, Fabio Cosman and uh, the audience. And I hope we can... Uh, uh, meet together in other occasions. So thank you very much. If you have some uh, last words, please. Uh, this has been uh, really fun. Uh, it was great to uh, and a pleasure to connect with you guys. Hopefully next time we'll be live uh, in San Carlos or Sao Paulo in some of the great places we have uh, uh, in Brazil. Uh, thank you, Mauricio, for, uh, for making this, this possible, all of you. And I look, I look forward to the next one. Okay, thank you. So I uh, remember that this presentation will be available in the YouTube of in our channel uh, at the YouTube, so uh, people can see again and again. <laughs> and uh, it's really very interesting content that uh, uh, will be made available by the Center for AI. So thank you. Have a a nice uh, uh, night or, <laughs> or afternoon in Brazil or in the other countries. So bye-bye. See you in the next seminar. Thanks, everyone. And feel free to send me emails if you have any questions.